So, substituting someone else's experience for your own, letting someone else do your thinking for you, is one way that experience can deceive. Another way is accepting feelings as truth or reality. The example we just gave about the relationship would be an example of accepting truth as reality. Um, here's another one. Not checking the experience that you have against testable laws, evidence, or reality. I was consulted some years ago to see a patient who had been a young man in his 20s who had type 1 diabetes and was admitted with diabetic ketoacidosis. That's when you don't take your insulin, your sugars go super high, and you get into very life-threatening condition from that. The doctor wanted me to assess him because he'd been a diabetic his whole life. He knew to take his insulin. He stopped doing it to see if he was suicidal, and this was his way to try to kill himself. Well, he was not suicidal. Then why did he stop taking his insulin? Because he went to a faith healer who publicly placed hands on him and healed him. He had a wonderful experience, felt euphoric, was overwhelmed by the Spirit, spoke in tongues, and was convinced by his experience that he had been healed. When I asked after the healing if he continued to monitor his blood sugars, he said, no, that would be a lack of faith. And if you don't have faith, you can't be healed. He had an experience, but he didn't want to actual evidence or truth or reason or thinking to challenge his experience. See, a person who loves God and loves God's kingdom would have done just the opposite of this. They might have also gone and had prayer in hands and been anointed and asked for healing. And if they believed they were healed, a person of faith, a true person of God's kingdom would have said, I'm going to start checking my blood sugars and I'm going to keep a log so I can show the evidence that I'm healed. The liar the father of lies has to convince people to close their minds to truth and evidence and to live in a false imaginary world. Another way experience misleads is something called globalization. Globalization. Using a real experience from a specific situation and then applying it to all other examples or situations of a similar nature. For instance, Say, witnessing a miscarriage of justice. Say, a police officer abusing their power and hurting or even killing a suspect. I know something like this could happen in society. And then, and then globalizing that, that officer's misconduct to conclude all police officers are abusers and can't be trusted and police departments need to be defunded. <laughs> Taking a real experience, globalizing it to all, Someone this week actually told me they had a conversation with their 18-year-old son who has, has this idea. He's been, because of uh, recent events, because of his social media that he follows, he has concluded that all police are corrupt and all police are untrustworthy and we need to defund them. That's his conclusion. How do you talk to a person like this? Well, I'm going to give you some stratagems. Okay? First, don't argue the specific event. Whatever the specific injustice that, that is the trigger, don't argue it. Give it to him. Give it to him. It was wrong. We agree. It's wrong. Just give it to him. Don't argue and don't put your focus upon the actual globalization that they're focusing on. In other words, they're focusing on police. Don't argue about the police, at least not yet. What you want to do is you want to move the discussion away from the police to some other aspect that they can identify with to expose globalization to expose the cognitive distortion that they're doing to themselves. You must understand the problem here the person has is actually not with all police. The problem is, is with a false conclusion that they've come to because they've taken a specific event and they've applied it globally, thus they have a false conclusion. That's their problem. So how do you get there? In this particular case, I recommended that the parent talk to their 18-year-old their, their who was a video gamer and ask the 18-year-old, um, hey, are there any video gamers that you know about that ever cheat? Well, yeah. Does that mean all video gamers cheat? <laughs> Very simple. No, it doesn't mean that. And then I would say this. Pre then, then present the following to them. Imagine that you entered a video gaming contest in which the winner receives a $10,000 prize, and you win! When you go to get your prize, you discover someone has stolen your identity and has already taken the $10,000. Would you be okay with that? You know what the 18 year is going to say, right? No. I said, what would you like to happen after that? Well, I want them caught and I want the $10,000. Who do you think is going to do that? 
<laughs> and no matter what they say at this point, it's only semantics, it's only labels. They, they might say, well, it'll be the rule enforcers, or they might say, uh, it, it will be the right of fires, or it might be the, the gaming commission, or the bank regulators. Uh, it doesn't matter what they say, they're talking about someone who is a law enforcer, which is police. <laughs> You could give another example. Hey, you just graduated high school this year. You're 18. Well, ha your parents buy you a, a brand new car. Two weeks later, it's stolen. What would you like to have happen? <laughs> would you like it, your car back? Well, who's going to do that? Who's going to chase the, down the thief? Hold them accountable. You really, you really want to do away with the police, do you? It's so easy to expose this stuff. You just have to give scenarios where they actually think. They, they've been so conditioned to just react. Yes? But if you have a whole segment of society that has that false understanding of something, then you have a pretty big problem on your hands. How are you going to change that whole segment of society? So, I guess I don't understand your question in regards to our personal responsibility. Um, it depends on your role and your relationship. In this particular case, it was a parent with their child. That's what I was talking about. I don't have a role with the society at large. I'm not in office. I don't have a role. I don't have an ability. I don't have a connection. So I don't have a place to go out and change society at large. The way the Christian method is, is we present truth and love and we leave people free. And one person at a time, we share with the people in our communities. And this is how the Christian world in the first century changed its society, the corrupt Roman government. So that would be the method. If you're asking about how does a, a human government do it, that's a different question. Well, it, it can be a problem if a whole segment of society, with your example, wants to defund the police, for example. Yes, and so the, the segments that don't, you know, depending, uh, ultimately, the, the, you're asking society, I would try to educate them, but if they wanted to do it, leave them free. See what happens. I will tell you, I will tell you guys, it's all a fraud. It is a fraud. It's a fraud by the people who are promoting it, and they know it's a fraud. In these cities where they're actually doing it, any of these politicians that are trying to defund law enforcement, see what happens if you get that mob to go to their house, break in and steal their stuff. They won't go, yes, this is great, we don't need any, they will have law enforcement out there faster than you can blink your eye, these same politicians that are doing this. They are liars and they're frauds, I'm just telling you. And if anybody doesn't believe me, test me on it. I'm not suggesting anybody do any crimes. <laughs> But, but I promise you, does anybody seriously believe that any of these leaders that are, that are wanting to, if, if somebody broke into their house, beat up their children, stole their property, they would not want law enforcement? Does anybody believe that? Nobody believes that. So what is it all about? Mind control. Well, what does it say about those leaders? That's what I'm saying. What is it all about? It's not about what they're saying it's about. It has a lot to do with fear. That's what they're trying to do. When they can get you afraid, they can then manipulate you, get you to give up more freedoms. Mm -hmm. So how do we challenge someone's personal testimony or experience that you believe may be leading them astray? Well, if they're not willing to have a dialogue, if they're in a rage, if they're having a temper tantrum, if they're screaming, if they're breaking things, if they're in a mob raging down the street, you cannot have any persuasion on them. So the first thing required to persuade somebody is they have to be willing to have a dialogue. Rational. If they're not willing to sit down and discuss things, and that's why Christ said you present the truth, you leave people free, but if they don't want the truth, shake the dust off your feet and move on to somebody who will. Don't cast your pearls before swine lest they turn and rend you asunder. So you have to discern there may be people out there that are completely hostile and corrupt and they have no interest in a better way. What's your responsibility? To, to have a confrontation and fight them? Not as Christians it's not. And so, how, so since you brought, I'm going to go on a diversion, not in the notes, go on a little side trail here. What about the use of force? Well, let me tell you about the use of force. 
If you want to just cut through all the mustard, cut through all the stuff that's going on out there, have clarity, all you have to do is think this way. Just pull it back into this frame and then apply it to the society. Parents dealing with a child or two who's having a raging temper outburst, breaking stuff all over their house. If you as a parent have that situation, do you want to take vengeance on your child? Do you? Do you want to harm your child? Do you want to inflict punishment on the child? Do you want to restrain the child, restore the child to calmness, discipline, which comes from the root word disciple, meaning to teach and educate, but not punish, meaning punitive, uh, comes from the root word punitive, to take vengeance upon. Do you want to do that? And so when you look at society, if you have love in your heart as a human being, then there is a place for restraining power. Not punitive power, not vengeance, not inflicting harm, simply restraining. And when you restrain the one, the child who's having the rage attack, you're not only protecting other children in the playground with them or in your home with them, you're protecting the child themselves. Do you remember the story of Desmond Doss? He tells the story about how in an adolescent he had a rage attack against his brother and almost killed his brother. And that is what tr was the major trigger for him to become a conscientious objector. Never use violence again because he was so convicted and horrified that he could have been that much out of control. You see, if he would have done that, he would have had serious grief, guilt, shame, uh, uh, searing of his conscience. It would have been a horrible thing for him to go through. It destroys the one who behaves this way. If you love them, you want to inter intercede for their best interest. So in society, when we see people doing this, there is a place for loving authorities to come in and restrain both for the innocent's sake and for the sake of those participating so they don't injure themselves even more. That's a righteous use of power. But it's never righteous to use what the human system calls justice. And the human system of justice is never about taking those people, restoring them to loving friendship and part of the family. It's about identifying the wrongdoers and locking them away from there and punishing them. So I got off on the side. Yes? Well, I think you just described in a lot of words what Romans 13, 1 to 6 actually says. In that way, people would take it in that Yes. But the way you just described it, I think, is what the apostle... That's right. And so, so we have to make that distinction between human governments that simply restrain and keep order, but they can never change hearts. You can restrain your own child, but you can't make your child love you. You can't. And so no amount of external force or power, even if it's restraining power, can change a heart. But it can limit damage done by those out of control of themselves. Sunday's lesson.